One of my favorite things about our church is congregational singing. To me, there's nothing more powerful, more moving than when we are in corporate worship singing praises to our Heavenly Father. There's times where we can thunder out over 90 decibels of volume during our congregational singing. In today's sound advice, I'm going to show you the centerpiece of our music ministry, the grand piano. Now you've heard me say before, live PA is the hardest type of sound to master. And if we're thundering out at 90 plus decibels, that means our pitch and tempo reference, the grand piano, has to be above that ambient noise floor. I'm going to show you why and how I mic the grand piano. I'm not a classically trained singer or any type of trained singer, and if you heard me sing, you would realize that I know what I'm talking about. I'm not a singer. Okay, that didn't quite go as smooth as I thought. We'll try it again. If you've heard me sing, you would realize I'm not a professional singer, and actually I should stick with uh, running the sound. One of the things that's really important during congregational singing is hearing your pitch and tempo reference. Now, if I can hear the note, I can reproduce it somewhat. But if I can't hear the note, I'm lost as a goose. So I'm going to show you how I mic the grand piano and why I mic the grand piano the way I do. Okay, here is our grand piano. This is 88 keys of bliss. You're not going to find any other instrument in the church that has the same frequency response as a grand piano, except our organ. The low end is 27 to 29 hertz, and the upper end is a little over 4,000, 4175, 4195, just depends on the tuning. That has a wide frequency response. That's a tall task to be able to reproduce that faithfully and then amplify it into the congregation. So the question is, how do we get all of those frequencies contained, zipped up to the mixing console, and then amplified through the speakers back to our eardrums? I use the Crown PZM30D. It's a pressure zone microphone condenser, so it requires fan and power. Now, your typical microphone is going to pick up sound waves. The PZM is a pressure zone microphone. It picks up the difference in air pressure. Also, the PZM works really well on a big flat surface. Let me show you. PZM is attached here. This plane also helps pick up sound while it's vibrating and then it comes back into this plate and then the pressure zone element right there helps us amplify the sounds. The bigger the plane or the bigger the zone that this is sitting on, the more low frequencies we're going to amplify. Also, I use two microphones for a stereo application. This is my uh, left microphone and then this is my right microphone. Anytime we use two microphones, we need to be careful that we don't get phasing. Another term we'd use is called comb filtering. I have our main microphone right over the dampers, which is right above the hammers. The hammer is what strikes the string. And then the damper is what helps control the tones and then the overtones. The piano is a percussion instrument, and so I'm using this microphone right here to help pick up that percussive attack. That is what gives me the tempo, the driving downbeat. If we can hear that downbeat, the driving downbeat, we're going to stay in time with the singing. This microphone is going to be more over the bridge of the piano. The bridge is where we're going to hear the sounds most efficiently because that's where the strings come in direct contact with the wood. One of the hardest things to tell people is where and how to mic the grand piano. Every instrument's going to be different, every room's going to be different, so it takes a little bit to figure out. This is the PZM30D. What I do is I'll put a piece of Velcro on the back, and then I'll put a Velcro strip on the bottom side of the lid. And then that allows me to mount the microphone and move it up and down the hammer area and up, or up and down over the bridge. That gives me the ability to put a mic on, play with it. If it works, great. If not, move it. 
I need to make sure that I'm going to get the fidelity out of the instrument and into the congregation. Now when we're pushing 90 plus decibels during our congregational singing, I can't rely on the low end of the piano to get out into the room. It just muddies up the sound. I need it to be clear. So sometimes I'll brighten the EQ on the mixing console between two, three, and 4,000 hertz. That's where we hear most efficiently. And if I can brighten the piano up or mic the piano over the strings, kind of the upper mid register of the piano, that's going to help with intelligibility and getting sound into the congregation. That means we can still hear the piano without having to just to blast everybody's eardrums out. There's a fine balance when you get that loud during your singing. There's a fine balance between loud and too loud. There's a men's meeting in Stillwater, the men's advance. We've clocked the congregational singing at over 104 decibels. That's one piano and 17 to 1800 men crammed into a barn. That's loud. And still at that volume, they need to hear pitch and tempo. A couple things to note about the grand piano. I like him oriented where the lid's facing out to the congregation. This lid is gonna help amplify the sound and push it out into the room. If that's pushing out into the room, that's less that I have to amplify. Another reason why I like the PZMs, you hardly see them. And in broadcast, it's nice to have a transparent look. The lid can be a little controversial, especially with piano players. One of the beauties of the grand piano is this lid and how high it arches open. But from a sound man's perspective, it's better to have that lid lower or changing the angle of how that sound comes out of the piano. So if you can imagine we're squashing the angle down and we have more volume to push further. Also, we can get the piano mics closer to the strings, which gives us a proximity effect. A proximity effect is going to give us better attack and better frequency response. A couple years ago, I had a really neat conversation with Joe Miser. I always believed that the sound originated from the strings, and then that's what we heard was the strings vibrating. But Joe shared with me the sound does originate with the strings, but then the vibration is transferred through the bridge to the wood, and this whole instrument is vibrating. And that's what gives the grand piano its unique sound. That's one of the main reasons why you can never find a keyboard that sounds exactly like a grand piano. And then this, this is so amazing to me. This piano, the EQ very rarely ever changes, but the style of the piano changes drastically based upon who's playing it. It's an instrument. It's an extension of their personality, their style, their interpretation of the piece that they're playing. So let's talk with Joe, find a little bit more about the piano and how it works. So the piano is really a really complex instrument when it comes to the sound that's produced because you know it may seem that the strings are the most important part and while they initiate the sound they're not what amplifies the sound. So if it were only the strings you'd have a very thin tinny sound. But a piano has a soundboard so the entire instrument really can be likened to a giant speaker cabinet. And even other parts of the instrument also vibrate in sympathy with everything else that's going on. The soundboard is a giant piece of wood, thin piece of wood, stiff piece of wood, but the strings pass over what's called the bridge. And those strings, as they couple with the bridge, are then coupled to the soundboard. So you might liken the bridge to the voice coil of a speaker that's moving a speaker cone. So as those strings vibrate, they cause the soundboard to vibrate, and then that sound is transferred both under and out the top of the instrument. The original intent with a piano was that it would be a large, powerful enough instrument to fill a well-designed performance hall with its own natural sound. There would be those people out there that would say that the piano can only be properly mic'd by distant miking because you have sound coming from so many places on the instrument. So those people would say, you have to distant mic to capture all of that properly. But we know that in live audio, that's really not gonna work well because primary reason, feedback. If we're trying to distant mic this instrument, we're just not gonna be able to get it loud enough or have enough of the percussive attack to really fill a room well and cut through during congregational singing. I've seen some things along the way that would be maybe mistakes in miking a piano. Um, 
one of the things that really made me laugh at one point was seeing a piano where somebody had taken a microphone, wrapped foam around it, and shoved it in one of the sound holes. That's a big mistake. You're not going to get anything resembling a normal sound out of the instrument from doing that. Another thing I've seen in the past was where a boundary microphone was laid under the piano on the floor. So we're now about two and a half to three feet from the underside of the piano. It was a very muddy, unclear sound, couldn't get enough volume from it. Again, feedback was a problem. So that's going to be some issues you're going to face in miking this instrument. The woods are chosen very carefully in building a piano, and each manufacturer would have a little bit different choices on some of the materials, but they're going to choose woods that are going to accomplish their purpose with regard to tone of the instrument. That's not the only thing that plays into the tone. Um, I was recently reading an article about a group of men that went to pick a new piano for their venue. So they went to a showroom to look at three different pianos. Now, the catch was they were looking at all three being the same model of piano from the same manufacturer. So why would they need to pick amongst three of those to decide which one? Because one instrument can pre be prepared multiple ways to sound different ways. So they tried all three of these pianos. Each piano had been prepared by a different piano technician and so that made each instrument have its own unique sound. So that made for a difficult choice for them because all three sounded good, but they each had a unique character to them. So the action unit in a piano is a very precise point on the instrument, and it responds very differently to the input that it's given. So whereas I may play one way, and get a specific sound out of the instrument from that. Another person may have a different type of attack to the notes. They may play softer, they may be timid, and there can be many, many variations on how the notes are played. Uh, piano teachers spend much time teaching students different ways to work with the keys of the piano because it is so responsive to what's done with it. Now grab your favorite pair of headphones. We're gonna do a listening demonstration. You're gonna hear exactly what goes to our broadcast mix. We're gonna start out with our main or left PZM microphone. This mic has been on this piano for over 20 years. You'll hear that in mono. Then we'll add the right PZM mic in mono, unprocessed. Then we'll pan left and right, and then we'll add the processing. You'll hear exactly what goes to our broadcast mix using the same mics that we use for our house mix. Thanks for taking your time to watch this video. But please don't walk away saying all of that is great information if, or if only if I had that, or that's only in a big church. Yes, it is specific to a grand piano, but there's a lot of principles that I talked about that will transcend instruments and techniques. The piano will be the hardest instrument that most of us will ever mic, so it's really important that we understand how it radiates sound and what we're wanting to get out of it. Miking techniques is equally important. We would never ask a vocalist to hold their microphone at their waistline. Same thing with the piano. It's an instrument. We need to learn how it radiates sound, what we're trying to get out of it, and what we're trying to accomplish with that sound. The angle of the lid is extremely important. Just like if you take your thumb and put it over the end of a garden hose, you're gonna restrict the water flow, so it's gonna push the water further. It's the same thing with the piano. If we restrict the amount of room that sound has to vibrate in, it's gonna project the sound further. Pitch and tempo are king in congregational singing. If we can't hear either, it's gonna be a train wreck. 
in our church service, you'll hear the cadence from the song leader, and I make sure the song leader is heard in the instrument's monitors. But in the house, you're primarily going to hear the percussive drive of the piano. Most people will default to singing to the level of the piano or your main instrument. So if we raise that overall volume of the piano, we're going to help raise the volume of the congregational singing. The melody is extremely important in singing. Most people will recognize the melody of the tune. Make sure that your congregation can hear the melody of the tune. Remember, we hear efficiently around two, three to 4,000 hertz. So if you're having a hard time punching that melody through the clutter of the room, try playing that melody in octaves or raise the melody one octave. And finally, it will take time to understand your piano. I've been miking this piano for 19 years. I'm still challenged by it. Don't be afraid to move things around to experiment, but don't do that right before a church service. In the notes, you'll find a link to Excellence in Church Music by Kevin Higginbotham. That's the guy that sits at this piano every service and thunders out amazing music. I hope you'll take some time to follow his blog and videos. I'm Jude, and this is my sound advice.